Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Series. That's right. We are continuing our year-long municipal series on municipal issues with municipal councillors, elected officials from across this great country. And we couldn't have been honored to have the, our guest on this show than we are right now. She is a first-term councillor for the city of Kitchener, representing Ward 10 in the city of Kitchener. Please help me welcome Councillor Ashlyn Clancy. Councillor Clancy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's so, nice to meet with you and talk with you. Exactly. It's nice to meet with you as well. So I want to get the first question right out of the way because that gives me a sense of who you are. Councillor Clancy, I know I know you said I can call you Ashlyn, but I'm I, just my my duty is always to say councillor. But Ashlyn, sure. where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, yeah, I'm a social worker and a parent and an environmentalist. Uh, so, you know, a few years back, I watched one of those documentaries that really hit home. It caught me at a, at a moment in time. And we were always quite environmentally minded, but it became clear that what we're doing and the way we're living is going to cause a lot of harm for my kids in the future. So I kind of started going down a path of advocacy, of environmentalism, and um, getting more involved in like lobbying with citizen climate lobby and, you know, changing our own life and the way we live in our home. But it became clear that more was needed. You know, the action isn't happening fast enough. And, you know, I worry as a parent, you know, for what we're, what legacy we're ha we are leaving future generations. So um, a lot of it has to do with just my duty to tell my kids that I did the best I could. And I worked hard to try to create a livable planet for them. You could have chosen many different ways to give back and serve, but you chose in 2022, the last municipal election to put your name on the ballot because you believe the best way to serve your community and advocate for that change, I'm assuming, is to get involved politically. What was that decision based on? Because you could have given back in many different ways through more uh, lobbying, more nonprofits, but you chose the political route in 2022. What was that about? I think climate wise, you know, I just felt like things weren't happening fast enough, you know, and even in our province, you know, we've had a lot of step backs, I think, environmentally speaking. Um, I had been helping with campaigns locally that were really championing sustainable sustainability in politics and trying to bring those arguments to different levels of government. So I felt like at this moment in time, I had a better toolbox to actually feel prepared to take that leap. Um, and it, it, it was related to, you know, as a province, how we're doing. Um, I wasn't, I'm not as optimistic that environmentally speaking, you know, we're going to make those gains and keep up the, the gains we've made. So I thought, you know, this context of the city, I know my neighborhood really well. I know my city well. I'm like an ambassador for Kitchener. I'm always trying to get people to move here. And when they come and visit, we're I'm going to so talk proud. about tourism and moving to Kitchener yes, later on. <laughs> yes, I love Kitchener. So and I love where I live. I love my hood. And so it felt like you know, being a ward counselor, it's a it's a contained space. It's a it's a, a portfolio to kind of that I felt like I was prepared to talk about the issues. I felt like we have eighteen thousand residents in Ward Ten. I thought I could talk to all of them. You know, um, I felt prepared because of the camp campaigning I'd done for others in different government levels of government. I just thought we need that strong climate equity focused voice on council and I wanted to do that. I wanted to, you know, challenge myself to serve in this way and I felt prepared to do so. Being on the ballot, being the name on the sign is a unique experience that only a few people have had the pleasure of being able to be on. Everyone has the opportunity to if you're a Canadian and you follow the rules, but you, you put your name on the ballot after being on the other side of the political realm of volunteering, helping other people out. What was that moment like when you saw your name on the signs, when you saw your name on the brochures that were being handed out? Was there a little sense of what am I got myself into? I'm putting myself out here more than I thought I would ever. Or was it a I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with this, this feeling that people are looking at my name 24 <laughs> seven? 
Well, it, it's, it is a different experience to be in the spotlight, right? Like even today, I'm like, ah, am I going to like say something I shouldn't? Or am I going to be understood the way I want to be understood? So for sure, that's like a, a growing part of the process. I mean, I was blessed in that I have a lot of people who share values, who are friends and family or volunteers showing out of no showing up out of nowhere. So I never felt I felt like, you know, a lot of people who I think really want to make these changes maybe are more introverted or maybe aren't at a stage of life where they have the capacity or the desire to like, you know, dedicate thousands of dollars and thousands of hours to something that might not work out. Like it is a very weird job to apply for. Um, but I always felt encouraged by the conversations I had at the door that kind of like really boosted me. Like I, I am extroverted, but it's exhausting, right? So um, trying to dig deep, but also just the energy you get from volunteers, from friends who are helping out every little $10 donation, you know, makes you feel like people believe in what you're you're talking about and the, a lot I don't I feel like I always say this to some of my stakeholders is like I'm just the face and the voice like we're I'm in I'm just a part of a team so I never felt alone in it like it it, it can wear you down and you have those moments where you you have to really dig deep to stay motivated but I am goal oriented I've had different goals in life where I like you know, I ran a thousand K during COVID and I was just like every little five to 10 K that you do. And I had a map and I color in every street that I canvas and, you know, every thousand uh, cards I dropped off. So, you know, there are some, there's some good feedback loops that help you keep going. Um, but yeah, definitely going onto social media wasn't something I'd done before. Um, like being interviewed on people's podcasts, you know, so there's lots of things I've had to adjust and just, it's just part of taking that leap, right? Like when you decide to do it, you can't do it halfway. You either are all in and you're putting yourself out there or you're not going to be successful. So, you know, I'm, I mean, I have a lot to learn, but I feel like I'm invested, right? Earlier on in the interview, you talked about, uh, the issues that were facing your city. And you, you talked specifically about environmental the concern about climate change. Um, during that campaign, the last municipal campaign where you were successful, when you were door knocking, did you hear, because I feel like you're a very politically minded person and you're very engaged and you kind of know what the pulse is of your community, but were there issues that came up that you didn't expect to hear at the doorstep that kind of took you back for a second and go, I didn't think this was an issue, but I'm glad someone's addressing it because we need all issues at the council table and not just the ones that the elected officials think are important. Yeah, and I think that's the beauty of talking to everybody, you know, um, and door knocking is like you don't just hear from a choir, right? Um, definitely the housing affordability piece and displacement like we I live really close to an encampment on uh, Victoria Street and Weber. And I've, I've noticed like you have an anecdotal relationship and I, but um, I became involved with the Better Tent City. It's a uh, managed, um, and it's, uh, they call it managed encampment, but it's not an encampment. They have small huts. So the more I learned about the issues affecting people who are living rough, the different kinds of solutions. We have really strong voices and amazing stakeholders in our community. And even just in the door. So from that angle, like learning more about what people need in order to be well, and what are the things getting in their way and how people end up uh, living rough and what are some of the solutions. That was really amazing to partner with. Like we have the working center, we have a better tent city um, who I really think are wonderful mentors in town of really supporting people struggling with addiction, struggling with homelessness and finding reasonable solutions. But then on top of that, like um, learning from people what it about the rental market, like our city has had really big leaps in the amount of rent people have to pay and this causes displacement, right? And um, there's different practices that corporations use to kind of push people out of their their houses. Um, there's demolitions, there's displacement, the high rents, people are choosing between, do I 
get cooling for myself? Do I pay rent? Do I eat? Do I pay rent? So like hearing that from people and the emotional experience, even if they have rent, they can afford, they feel trapped. Like I had a kid now and I can't move because I don't think I can afford anywhere else. You know, I'm a legacy tenant. So, you know, um, I really had a lot. I knew about the issue as a social worker. I knew that People were getting evicted and rent evicted. I knew that housing affordability was a huge issue, but really complementing my understanding of it with expert knowledge and lived experiences of folks helps me to, to really push forward to try to see how the city can make uh, living here possible, you know, and yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about some issues that are facing the city of Kitchener a little bit later, but I want to uh, go back to election night now. So let's go back to October of last year on election night. <laughs> I'm assuming you know the question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What's going through your head the moment they've announced that Ashlyn Clancy is the next councillor elect for Ward 10 for the city of Kitchener? It was oh, it was uh, an amazing moment. Like it was, I was surrounded by people who supported me through that journey. Um, it was exhausting. Like I started in July, and I probably didn't miss a day. Uh, so it was, you know, you're kind of on cloud nine. Like I was really hopeful. Like I had done the work. I had covered the the ward and knocked on all the doors, and I. Camp campaigned, you know, I had signs everywhere, but that moment where it was really happening was kind of surreal, you know, like it's a meta moment where you're, you know, ex it's exciting, you get to really live that with close friends and family and volunteers. It was pretty special. Yeah, it was pretty when, cool. When does cloud nine, na, na, cloud nine, I apologize, come back to reality? Because you're elected and now oh no, the weight and the burdens of the city and the decisions I make are going to affect my neighbors, my community members, and I need to do the best job. When does that sink in? Is it, has it sunk in yet? Or how, did it sink in the first time you walked on the, into the city hall and as an elected official? Yeah, there wasn't really a break, right? <laughs> like, um, Bill 23 came yep. out the next day, right? So that was like a brick wall and it was a shock, you know? So I had campaigned on a whole whack of, of really big pillars, right? Of of how do we build differently? You know, I'm in a, a, a ward that has a lot of big development and, you know, I'd love to see, you know, progress made on sustainability, right? And so that was tricky. Um, like training was on the Thursday after the election. So there wasn't a turnaround, right? Like I kind of, I think when I was in the campaign, it was like the first council meetings, not till late November or like early December. Nope. And so I thought, okay, great. I can have a minute, like a minute to just sit down and, you know, recharge, but that didn't happen. So, but, um, you know, I think it's each time you do something new, right? Like now we're in budget season and I just really want to bring my full self. So like it means, you know, sorry, kids, you know, I got it. Mommy's got to like read up, right? So I have to be vulnerable. I have to ask a lot of questions. I'm really uh, blessed in that I have there's great support staff here and they've done they've invested in orientation so I'm grateful that they've really taken that that uh, phase of being new and all the you know uptick of getting savvy with things and people have been really helpful I've had zero negative experiences you know everybody's been happy to answer questions and I mean for sure online you know okay. like when we talk about raising people's property tax like that's not a good feeling right like yeah. but I am glad at least in the city of Kitchener for example that you know we keep it below the rate of inflation for example and um you know I think I share the values of my fellow counselors and the staff so you know that's been good is that I don't feel like I'm butting heads with people I feel like you know even though I was hoping for a minute you know um they did recognize that we have a lot to learn and people have been glad to answer questions take time to meet with me and 
Um, so, you know, what's been the biggest um, learning curve? What's been the biggest learning curve for yourself in this literally, and I I hate to put it this way, but the first hundred days in office we're almost at with you. And, uh, what's been the biggest learning curve that you go, I wish I would have known this then. So that way it would have better prepared me for this role, even in the first few hundred days of office. Yeah, I think I'm still learning how to be a politician, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you I seem really to be want... doing well. You, you seem I, to be I'm answering. trying. I feel like I I do my homework and I ask lots of questions. I try to not think there's no dumb question, you know, I just ask it. There's a million acronyms, you know. Oh. Um and like, you know, it's hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So there is that on your mind of like, you know, over time I'll get better at knowing what's the flexibility of it all. But I think just, uh, yeah, being a politician, like those relationships with fellow counselors, right? Like if I want to move something forward, I'm one vote, you know? So there's a lot of a process between like, okay, I want to, I'd like to see us get here and we're here and I, I need to figure out some of the dynamics of, you know, building relationships across the horseshoe and building buy-in, building political will, you know, and, so I have to, I'll have to lean on, I, I, you know, I did put a motion forward for related to bill 23 and that was a learning curve, you know, like I, I was like, you know, let's do it, you know, but you know, I needed a few redirects, which is fine. Um, so yeah, I still have a lot to learn when it comes to like building the support around some initiatives that I want to champion. You talked about your family life, and I, I, I like to talk a little bit about that if you're comfortable with that. If not, please just tell me to step away here. But you talked about, you t- you tell your kids, mommy needs to go do something right now, so I need to focus. Have you found a balance between work life and personal life? Because as an elected official, you're on 24-7. You can't go to the grocery store, I'm assuming, without someone stopping you and saying, hey, can we talk about this issue or can we talk about this issue? So I can imagine as someone sort of green like yourself who's new and wants to do a good job, it's challenging to say, no, can we talk about it at a later time? Because it seems like you're very personal and want to actually engage with your voters and your residents because they're the ones who put you there. Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure that out, right? It's a part-time job, but it's not really, you know, <laughs> no, it kind of seeps, in, seeps into all these different nooks and crannies. So, I mean, the campaign was probably worse, you know, like I wasn't home for dinner for a bunch of months. So it's been actually, there's been some good things that came of it where like, there's a bit more balance at home where I'm not doing every, everything all the time. You have to ask for help, right? From people in your life in order to so yeah like there's been a cost I don't really host my friends anymore Uh, you know I try to keep in touch with people but it's hard you know you feel like a bit of a jerk if you have to like reschedule things a bunch but people have been understanding about it like every now and again my kids are I think they're tickled by it you know I think they enjoy do they know know, mom's a counselor and (laughs) she has weight in the city now like I could use it against my friends my my mom's a counselor you know, uh, I think they know what I do. And um, there was like a local like leadership program and they they visited City Hall. So my kids came, they're 10 and 12. So they're a bit more, they're a bit more uh, grown up ish. Okay. You know? So they have a better, they have a good understanding. And we talk a lot of politics at home anyway. But um, yeah, I think they're proud. And I think they, they learn from that. But for, for sure, sometimes they want it to go away and just have me all to themselves. Right. So I can understand that. Like they have a PD day today, probably, you know, on another day I'd be, you know, having, I'd have lunch with them. I, would you know, check in and like try to get them outside, but like, you know, I'm talking to you. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. I'm just teasing. I'm joking as well. Yeah. They're fine. They're okay. They're okay. Yeah. They're good. But yeah, it's a work in progress. Before I go to the next segment, I want to preface this question because we always get a lot of feedback whenever we ask this question, but I want to preface this by saying, this is a question, this is a conversation between Councillor Clancy and myself. This is not a direction at council. This is not an opinion of council. This is not a motion at council. This is her opinion. They have council deliberations. They have council conversations. So my question to you, Ashlyn, is in your opinion, and this is your opinion as counselor, 
what is the biggest issue facing the city of Kitchener today as of recording this? Uh, it's two, but they're very interconnected. So nope. let's, I think, let's talk about both then. Yeah. Like I think climate and equity and housing kind of all kind of come together, you know? So I think climate's going to be our biggest challenge in the next 50 to a hundred years, right? As our climate changes, we're going to, and we're transitioning our energy, right? But acutely right now we have a, we have a housing crisis, right? Um, so yeah, there's kind of like a short-term, long-term thing and, and even short-term, like, I don't think the climate, we can ever say it's a long-term crisis. It's happening as we speak. Um, yeah. And, and I think as we transition our energy, we don't want to leave anyone behind. And so, yeah, that equity kind of lens, it, it feeds into, you know, how we become a sustainable city without leaving anyone behind, including all voices in that discussion. And then with housing, you know, we, people are becoming displaced. People are battling addiction and living rough and underhoused, right? We have an exploding population of people experiencing homelessness. So those are the things that I think I see we are grappling with. You so know. You, you've asked my question for me, but I'm going to ask the million dollar question again. You, how does the city of Kitchener become a sustainable city in the short term to benefit the long term of the city when it comes to the climate crisis, in your opinion? Yeah, I think we have to not be afraid of this huge challenge at our feet like our we kitchener owns its own utility so we own our natural gas utility as does kingston and you know we lean on that for some of our funding right and but it's not sustainable we're burning a fossil fuel and so we have a huge challenge ahead of us of how do we get energy in other ways and in ways that we could still rely on to fund and power our city so it's gonna we're gonna be having to try a lot of new stuff and we are trying those new things like uh, there's a lot of great innovation happening in Kitchener but how do we scale that right that's a huge endeavor that we'll be looking at in the coming years and are residents open are residents open to that are, are residents of Kitchener open to the idea that we need to transition and yet again I'm just I'm going off your questions this is not the Alberta we're going to bash everyone who says the energy industry is bad because really that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to talk about your city or the city of, is the city of Kitchener residents open to the transition that you are talking about there? I think they will be buy-in. Like, I mean, I have, a, I, I had a lot of appeal at the doors when we talked about energy people. I think that was what helped me differentiate myself from other candidates was just my, my um, goals related to sustainability. I think people, it's happening, right? Like, um, I think we pride ourselves in Kitchener at being, trying to be leaders in in some of the goals that we set. So, um, but we don't want to greenwash either, right? So uh, I think it's, for me, it's not about people being open to it or not open to it. I think they'll come along for the ride. I think nobody's married to one kind of energy. They just want their house to be warm and they want to be able to afford their bills. So I do think that that's how we can achieve that is we can heat homes in a way that doesn't make the climate crisis worse. That doesn't mean that people uh, can't eat, you know, or pay yeah. their bills. So I think that we, as long as we keep in mind people who are living on a fixed or low income, when we make these adjustments, um, I think people will be supportive. They know that the climate crisis is ours. We're owning it and we have to do, we have to change how we power our lives and move. Yeah. But there's yeah. growing pains. Yeah. There, there always is. Um, you talked about housing as well. And we talked about it earlier in the interview, but I want to go into a little bit more detail if that's okay with you. The province has said that they want a certain amount of housing units built in the next 10 years. This is on the backs of a lot of municipalities. Um, how is Kitchener stepping up to address the housing crisis? And is there more work to be done that you, you want to see get done? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Kitchener has, a, we've built so many units and I think we've, 
like through our regional official plan that uh, hasn't been fully ratified yet, there is a not, there's projects in the pipes. Uh, we're a growing city. People want to build here. Um, my only concern is that um, there's two caveats, like with the recession, you know, a lot of those condo projects aren't as financially viable at the moment. So they're on hold or materials cost more. So I do feel like we still need a lot of funding from our province and our federal government to um, offset some of that and invest in affordable housing. Like we, we, I think as a city are building a lot in different categories, but we need to fit, we need to diversify, uh, continue to di diversify. And I think the city is actively looking at ways to make that more possible. So how do we change our zoning to be more inclusionary? How do we encourage, you know, um, I think uh, Kitchener was a leader to kind of offset some of the developmental charges for development charges for affordable housing. But um, I think the area where we have more work to do is to protect low income housing, you know, as we, as people look for property, especially in the downtown to invest in, um, you know, we do want to build up, you know, we would do want to intensify to a certain degree, but I think we have to make sure we are not displacing people who live in affordable housing, who will be impacted by some of those developments. So, you know, I'd like to see us do better in how we protect people from rent evictions, displacement when properties are demolished and units are, are lost. So how can we do better and even just protecting pro property standards, you know, as as investors get more into housing, sometimes they make a buck by not maintaining buildings as much as they could. So we are, as a city, ramping up some of our property standards, hopefully soon, uh, so we can make sure that that's not a cost savings, that it's a human right. Now, I'm going to be honest. If I go to the city of Kitchener again, because I'm originally from Ontario and I'm looking forward to coming back to Ontario this summer to tour all these great cities that are coming on the show. So I'm looking forward to potentially sitting down with you for a coffee one day in Kitchener, if you're up for it. Um, but if I go to Kitchener tomorrow and I ask a hundred people in ward 10 or across the city, what the major issue is for them, there's going to be some overlap. There's going to be some major issues, housing, rent affordability, climate crisis, but then they're going to get the more specific issues. There's a pothole on my street. The sidewalk on my street is a little damaged. The park that is in our area, it hasn't been upgraded in four or five years. How do you balance the needs of so many people against moving the city ahead? Because you're there to represent Ward 10, but you have ten other, nine other councillors and a mayor who are also there representing their wards in the city, and you need to push for your community, but you also have to realize that the city comes first and then your representation of Ward 10 is there as well because you're there to move the city forward, not just your specific area. So how do you balance the needs and issues that your residents have with the needs and issues that the city has? You know, I try to be a good listener and to address people's concerns. So I might not always give people the answer they want, but I I do my best to get them more insight into the issue. I try to get a response and be responsive. I want to give people time so that I can hear, hear them out. Um, you know, and then in terms of priorities, like, I guess I am fortunate. I do feel like I share the values of my city. Not always, like, we're going to disagree. Um, there's lots of people who have different opinions on how I should be, what what opinions I should share at council, what I should push up for and against. Um, and that's going to happen. So, but I do want to be relevant. I do want to make sure that we're not we're not that we're speaking for a greater majority. So, I mean, I haven't found the the magic in terms. Like, I know a friend of mine said somebody in Ottawa, when they were getting a proposal for something, would go and canvas like a sample. Like, it, let's say there was eighteen thousand people in her ward, she would temp, try to get ten percent sample. So, canvas one hundred and eighty or. Is that 1800? <laughs> Pardon me? 1800. 1800. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a lot. I don't think I could do that. But I think what she wanted to do, sorry, my math brain didn't work for a minute there. Um, but yeah, I think what she wanted to do was say, okay, I'm hearing from certain stakeholders, but really, what is what is my word 
think and feel. So um, I'd like to get to that, you know, where I feel like I, I'm responsive to the greater community. But I mean, I also rely on the staff, like the staff are doing phenomenal work around uh, engagement surveys, committees of people with lived experience, like um, advisory committees. So I do also trust a lot of what the staff are doing with in terms of engagement to make sure we're staying true to what the community really needs and wants. Perfect. Let's turn to our last segment because I am cautious of time here. And this is my favorite segment, not saying that I didn't enjoy the first two segments, but this is the fun one. This is the one that I get to learn about your community from the people who are elected. Tourism, 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 tourism. We got a little shimmy there for those who are uh, watching this or listening to this and not watching it. Um, Councillor Clancy, if I was a tourist to your city this summer, what are some of the highlights and hidden gems that I should be visiting while in your city? I love Kitchener because it is actually a very diverse community. So we are top five in Ontario for immigration. So we have a phenomenal representation of cultures. Um, I would go to our market. It's in Ward 10. But uh, the top floor is all these kiosks. And there's food from all over. You can have food from El Salvador, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, coffee, um, Greek food. It's phenomenal. So I would go to our Kitchener Market because I think you can really get a flavor of, and even if you walk around that area, oh, there's um, Vietnamese sandwiches, subs that are awesome such a good deal so delicious so i you know i know toronto people love to go there to eat but that's a lot of, you know you got to deal with the traffic and you gotta like you know it's expensive but i think Tr kitchener is a nice beautiful uh salad of different tastes and flavors so we have a rich cultural diversity and so i'd encourage you to you know go along our king street go to the market and eat and then i'd also say our trails are getting pretty awesome and we we're investing more in those so i'm enjoying how bikeable our city is becoming so when i had friends come recently i live along a little trail called the spur line so we got hopped on the e-bike we zoomed around on these, you know, rail trail paths to downtown Waterloo, to downtown Kitchener, to Victoria Park. And uh, it's such a nice way to experience the city is enjoying our trail system and, and exploring our parks. So, yeah, that's kind of my, some of my faves. Is there a hidden gem? Is there a, is there a place in the city that you go, this should be promoted a little bit more? Is there a little coffee shop or a brewery that's like one of those unique places that tourists need to stop? You talk about your market, which I'm going to stop in because I'm a big fan of uh, different food. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to getting out the trails as well. But what's the, what's the place that you go to, to decompress? That one place in the city that you go, you know what? Long day. I'm going to go here. Hopefully no one finds out because it's such a unique place that I get to go to. And it's a hidden gem that I get to see. Well, I guess, you know, for my culture, my taste, I, there is a spot, like if you're going to go for brunch, I would say the Yeti and it's beside the market and they just have, they have fun stuff in the evenings, but they have fun stuff in the daytime. Of course, like our festivals, I would come like kind of check out what's happening. We had a dog festival and we had a Middle Eastern festival. So some of those fest, like the dog festival, like 10,000 people coming downtown with their dogs to shop for their dogs and get dog entertainment. So if you're a dog person, it depends on what you like. I, uh, I love TWB. So that's uh, Together We're Bitter. It, it's a cool little pub. Uh, uh, craft brewery and they have great outdoor space in the summer with live music and uh, different food vendors popping up um, yeah so I don't know I so, guess it depends what you're into I'm looking forward to exploring a little bit more in depth uh, when I'm there this summer so my last question for you Councillor Clancy is this and you can take as much time to answer this question if you if you want but what makes the city of Kitchener such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, I think, you know, when they talk about places in the world, they call it the Toronto Waterloo Corridor, but it's actually Kitchener, I will argue, <laughs> that um, we have this huge tech 
sector explosion, right? So our the KW area is booming in terms of innovation. So I think if you're coming here, it's like for my family, my husband was in the tech sector. So he went to Catalyst and he was in the incubator. So we have a really neat community that's um, thriving related to innovation. So you could, I think people who are in that line of work could find a place to be. And I like where I live because it's walkable. So that's what I love about Ward 10 is like, you know, I, I did live in Toronto and, but it was hard to get around, right? Like I love being in the city. I love being, having access to transit and biking and stuff like that. But Kitchener is just smaller. So you can live in a, you know, I live in an old home. I can walk to the city hall. I can walk to the market. I think it's a walkable place. Uh, we have the tech sector and it's diverse. So, and I think it's really emerging. Like I'm a social worker. We have our social work school. And I think there's really a blossoming equity movement of people from our indigenous communities, from our BIPOC communities. And I think we're moving in the right direction in terms of making sure all voices are represented and heard and thought of in the planning, you know? So I, I hope people would feel that when they come here. Well, thank you so much for this. This has been an honor to sit down with you for the last 40 minutes to talk about your community of Kitchener, yourself, but also your duty to serve. So thank you so much, Councillor Clancy, for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Thanks for having me and for raising these municipal thoughts um, to your listeners. And yeah, I look forward to feedback and and keeping in touch. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media. Go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Series. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.